uh, your, your formal session two, where we're going to discuss things around hypothesis testing, comparing two samples. I know that the last time we met, we were discussing one sample. So today we're going to learn how we do this hypothesis testing when we look at two samples or two groups. Um, yeah, so we can get to it. So for the rest of July, this is the session. And then um, hopefully by next week or the following week, I will let you know on the WhatsApp group um, or the beginning of July, when is our next session um, and what topics we're going to be covering for August. So I need to send them first to Jacques to confirm and then we can and then they can book the sessions. Um, yeah, so let's and remember the sessions we meet bi-weekly, not on a weekly basis. So we're going to meet again after another week. So after a second week we meet. Um, I was going to ask if you have any question or query. Um, I'm not sure if you do have any question, but do you, before we start with today's session. Do you have anything to say or comment about? So I guess everybody knows where to find all the information, including all the slides for today as well. I have already I've updated the uh, the folder so the notes for today's session and for the past sessions that we had, and I also did post in advance the other two sessions that I think they might follow in August. So you must um, go to the notes section and check. Is there anyone who wants to say something? Um, it's me. Yes. Um, I want to ask if um, where are the the previous sessions because this is my first time joining the sessions um, because I, I, I couldn't um, register. I've been struggling to register, so it's my first time. So I don't know where to find the previous notes. Um, is it possible to okay. kind of before the end of the session? Uh, okay. Closer to the end of the session, I will show you where to find. I will put the link for you on the chat. Mm -hmm. It's also on the WhatsApp group. If you are not on the WhatsApp group, then we can also share that with you. I will share mm -hmm. the link and I, if we have time, I will also go and show you when you go to my UNISA it, because everything is on my UNISA. It's easily accessible via my UNISA. Um, how you can access the recordings of the previous sessions and the okay. notes. I will show you that at the end of the session. Ne? Thank you so much. Mama. All Thank right. You. So let's, unless if there is another question. Okay. If there are none, then let's look at hypothesis testing when we look at two groups. <clears throat> Um, I have here yes, statistical tables, but for your module, you do not have to use any statistical table for finding the p-values and um, for finding the probabilities because, uh, or finding the critical values, because in your module, they don't expect you to do technical things but they expect you to know the basic concepts. They expect you to know how certain things are arrived at, how a decision is arrived at. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to show you tables, uh, but I will make reference to where we find the information when we do some of the things in hypothesis testing as well, especially when we do uh, when we make decisions as well. Then you also need a calculator. <clears throat> because there are certain aspects, certain questions where they will ask you to do some calculations. You, you need a proper calculator because sometimes um, a normal calculator doesn't do what you need it to do because there are functions that you need. So those on the WhatsApp group, I did send you a link um, that you can download a calculator onto your phone and it will look exactly 
Uh, maybe I can show you my calculator. It will look exactly like this calculator, but it will be on your phone. Um, so that if you don't have a calculator or a proper calculator, then you can follow the steps that we're going to be doing and be able to work it out by yourself using your phone or your calculator. Um, this is a case show. Normally, um, you find this case show at pick and pay shop, right? And check us and gain. Anyway, uh, the grade 12 learners and grade 11 learners are encouraged to use the Casio calculator so it's easy to be um, to get um, and I think it's reasonable enough as well so okay so by the end of the session you should learn or you should know how to use hypothesis testing for comparing the difference between two means of two independent population groups or two means of related population groups. So here we're talking about independent population groups. It means the the groups comes from uh, two separate, or you create two separate groups that do not influence one another, or related uh, groups where you want to test the two related groups where those two groups um, uh, are related or uh, they can influence one another because then when we talk about the related groups we're talking about a example will be where you do a pre-test and then you do a post-test so the same group will be exposed to the pre and will also be exposed to the post so it means one will influence the other how you did before will influence how you do now as well so we're going to look at how we make decisions based on the two scenarios as well. So <clears throat> like I already explained, when we do for independent samples, then you have two groups. Maybe you have males and females, or you have uh, a group from Gauteng and a group from Western Cape, and you want to compare how they um, their opinion on certain matters. And though you do a test based on those two groups. And also when we talk about independent groups, it means the observations that are in one group cannot be in another group as well. Um, and then when we talk about related samples, which are dependent samples, then it's the same group, but you test the before and the after. So you look at before they take medication and after they take medication. So it's the same group of people. So you expose them and you, you you first test them before you expose them to the treatment as well. So that is the two sample test. So we're going to first start looking at the independent samples. So when we talk about testing the uh, hypothesis testing for independent, we also want to check if there is a difference. We want to test whether there are differences between the two groups. And usually for independent samples, there are two scenarios that can happen. When they, the, um, they come from the same population or different population, it doesn't matter whether they, they, the samples that you select come from two di different population groups. The, when the population variances are unknown but they are assumed to be equal when so if the population variances or the population standard deviations are equal then we're going to use the t-test and we're going to use the um, when we calculate the standard error we use the schooled uh, the pooled variance. Now, the reason why I'm not going to show you the pooled variance is you are not expected to know how to calculate the pooled variance because I think also because it's time consuming as well. But just for interest sake, know that there is what we call a pooled variance. So when you calculate the test statistic, you use the pooled variance for the equal population variances. The one that we're going to concentrate on is when you are given the population or when the population variances or standard deviations are unknown and we know when they are unknown we use the 
the t the t test statistic when they are unknown but they have unequal variances and they we're going to use the normal standard error and i'm going to show you how we calculate that um, t test as well so <clears throat> And always remember when we do hypothesis testing, your null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis always refers to your population parameter. So it will say the population mean of group one minus the population mean of group two or the population group um, population mean of group one is, e is equal to the population mean of group two. That's what we want to test. I already explained this, that we're going to use the pooled variance t-test, and then for the other one, we used the normal um, separated variance t-test. I will show you at a later stage. So the other thing that you need to know is when you do independent samples, there are certain assumptions that needs to be met as well. The samples, uh, before I even move to this one. So for the equal variances, the assumptions are the sample needs to be randomly selected and independently, independently drawn. The population needs to be normally distributed with a sample size of more than 30. And the population variance needs to be unknown. And this is for the independent variable or for the independent uh, groups. Uh, where the variances are assumed to be equal. For those that are assumed to be not equal, the only thing is the population variances are said to be assumed to not to be equal. That's the only difference between the two. When we do hypothesis testing as well, remember the first step of everything we need to state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So when we do for independent sample, regardless of which one we're doing, so whether you, you're doing for uh, where the population variances are known, where you do a pooled variance t-test or you do a separated variance t-test, reading the statement that the researcher wants to prove will guide you in terms of how your alternative um, hypothesis needs to be. Whether are we testing for the lower test, which is um, the less than, or are we testing for the upper, te uh, the upper test, which will use the greater than, or are we doing a two-tailed, which the two will be a, a directional, one directional test, and then the two-tailed test, which will be a non-directional test. So you need to read the question carefully when they give you the statement in order to identify whether are you doing a one directional or are you doing a two-tailed test. It's very, very important because if, for example, in the statement they talk about the decrease then you need to know that you are going to do a lower tail therefore in your alternative hypothesis your null hypothesis will stay remember the null hypothesis can always be equal the alternative hypothesis will have a less than and we can state that the hypothesis testing in this manner or we can say the mean of population group one minus population group two is less than zero if they talk about increase, then we know that we're doing an upper tail test or one directional upper tail test, which then we can also state the alternative as the mean for population group one is greater than the mean of population two, or we can state it in another manner. For a two tail test, they might say, is there a difference or is there a change? Uh, and then your null hypothesis will say, there is no change or there is no difference and then your alternative will say there is a difference because then you will put an equal and uh, not equal <clears throat> and when you make a decision because at the end once you have stated your null hypothesis and you know which test you're doing a one directional or a two directional you need to make a decision and visually 
when you make a decision uh, for a one directional lower tail, if we use the critical values, these are what we call critical values. If we use the critical values, then we will reject the null hypothesis if your test statistic that you would have calculated is less than your critical value. If it's an upper tail area, if your critical value in the upper tail or the positive side of the graph, if it is greater than your critical value, we reject the null hypothesis. For a two-tail test, then we look at the two regions of rejection, which is the upper tail, sorry, the upper tail and the lower tail. So if it falls in any one of the two, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. In your module, I think most of the time you use the p-value and the decision for the p-value, we always state that if your p-value, if your p-value is less than alpha, which is your level of significance, then we reject the null hypothesis. So you can make a decision based on the p-value and the alpha, or we can make a decision based on the critical value and the test statistic to get to the same decision as well. So just to remind you as well, the steps that you need to always remember when you do your hypothesis testing is the first step is to state the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis in order to know whether are you doing a one directional test or a, two di a, a, a non directional test. Step number two, you need to define what kind of a test you're doing because you need to read the statement in order for you to know what you are given. Are you given the population standard deviation? Are you given one sample? Are you giving two groups? What is it that you are given? What what level of significance are you given? So you need to state those so that once you know the things that you are given or the facts given in your statement, then you can say for sure you're doing a t-test. And also when you're doing a t-test, it's very important to know whether are you doing a pool test or are you doing a some a, a, a a separated variance t test which in this instance we just call it a t t test which will have a subscription c at the end or it can have a t state um subscription t state then once you have identified what kind of a test you do doing then you need to calculate that test so it means you need to compute you need to take a calculator and substitute the values into the formula and do the calculations and calculate your test statistic. Once you have your test statistic, then you can find the p-value and make a decision. Or you can find the critical value and make a decision. And that is the final step to make that decision. And when you make the decision, you're always going to refer back to your null hypothesis statement. What you already hypothesized, the value should be at the beginning. So it means when you make your conclusion, after you make a decision, when you conclude, it needs to refer back to how you stated your null hypothesis. Okay, so let's look at an example where we do hypothesis testing for an independent sample. So let's say if we need to test um, if there is, oh, yeah, I'm just giving you an example of the steps. So null hypothesis will state will state that uh, there is no difference between treatment and control groups, um, and the alternative will mean um, will say there is a difference. The key thing here is recognizing that your null hypothesis should state that there is no difference because if they are equal there is no difference in your alternative it will state that there is a difference so it means if it's um, a difference in terms of there is an increase in the treatment or the control 
responses, then it will be an upper tail. If it says there is a decrease in the control group, then it will be a lower um, a, a lower uh, test. And if it just says there is a difference, then or there is a difference, then you will use a not equal, which will give you a non-directional. So in this, I'm just showing you one of the examples that you can have in your alternative hypothesis. Then you need to state what type of a test you're doing based on the information that you would have gathered. Then you will state that you're doing a t-test, and then you're going to compute a test statistic, which in this instance, we're looking at, if we're looking at the at independent samples where the population um, variances are not equal, then we will use the t-test and which will be your mean, your sample mean difference minus your population mean difference. And because in your null hypothesis, you always state that it, the mean Mine. population mean difference is equals to zero. So this will always be equals to zero. Is there that a is question? Helpful. Please make sure that you mute your microphones. So this will always be equals to zero. Therefore, this equation will always say the sample mean difference divided by the standard error, which is the square root of your sample variance one divided by the sample size one plus sample variance two divided by the sample size two. And that will give you the test statistic. And then we can use the p-value that we will get from a computer uh, application where it generates that information for us, and then we can make a decision. And then lastly, we make a decision. And if we use the critical value, then we make a decision based on the critical values. OK, so let's look at an example. So we are interested in whether the type of movie someone sees at the theater affects their move, their mood when they leave. We decided to ask people about their mood as they leave one of the two movies. The comedy movie, which is group one, had 20 people in it. And the horror movies, it had also 20, which is group two, which has 20 people who were watching that movie. Our data are then uh, coded that the higher Sorry. scores indicate a more positive mood. Sorry? Yes. A quick one. Do we ask questions as we go along? Or... Yes. Okay. A uh, quick one. Looking at this one here, I see the two groups here have got ends both n equaling 20. So looking at that uh, sort of uh, uh, the information you provided earlier, so these two ends in this case have to be always, always have to be uh, equal in size or something like that. Is that the case? Yeah. So they can the, be different sizes. The ends can be different because this comes from two different groups. Ah, so okay. it, it could have been that people who came from the comedy were 18 and then those who watch the horror were 20. Okay, thank you. So the size um, for for the independent groups it doesn't have the sample sizes doesn't have to be the same, doesn't have to be equal. Only for the paired test later on, those ones they need to be equal because it's the same group. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Okay, so we give we told that the higher score indicates that there is a more positive mood, and we are given some sample statistics, which they gave us the sample size. We know that from the statement given, they give us the sample mean for group one and group two, and the sample standard deviation for group one and group two. <clears throat> So as a researchers, we know we have a good reason to believe that people living the comedy will be in a better mood. So we use a one tail test at alpha 0 0.05 to test our hypothesis. 
So this, they gave us the information that we required. So they are telling us they that uh, we're going to be doing a one tail test at alpha 0 0.05. And we also have all the facts that we require. So the first thing we do is to state My slides are scrambled. The first thing we do is to state the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. <clears throat> so the null hypothesis will state that there is no difference. So the mean for population group one mi uh, minus the mean for population group two is equals to zero, or the mean of population group one is equals to the mean of population group two. The alternative Already we are told that we're doing a one tail test and we were told that it, uh, high score will mean the higher score will mean a positive mood. So we can assume that the higher score is greater than. So we say mean one will be bigger than mean two or we can say the difference between mean one and mean two will be greater than zero. That's step number one. Now we go and find other information that we given. We state those because they're going to help us in identifying what kind of a test we're doing. And we know that we're doing a t-test. Te <clears throat> and here we can also assume that our population variances are unknown and our population variances are different. We can assume that. Therefore, that is why we're using this t-test and we substitute the values into the formula of our t-test. Remember, the top will state your sample mean one minus sample mean two divided by the square root of your standard deviation squared or your, your variance of population one, because now we were given the standard deviation. So it will be 320 squared divided by 20 plus for the standard deviation of group two, we had 318. So because we calculate using the variance, so we square the standard deviation, divide by the sample size, which was 20. And when you calculate, you get 4.461 as our t-test. And based on our critical value, once we go and find the critical value, which we would have found earlier from the test, from the t-test. And remember for your module, you do not have to go and learn the tables because you will never get the tables in the exam as well. They will supply you with the information that you require to make a decision. So in this instance, the t-test, if we're using the critical value, the critical value will be given to you to say make a decision. And then we can know that with our critical value, we can create a region of rejection. So we know that we're doing a one tail test, which is a one directional test, and it's in the greater than. So it means our critical value, the region of rejection will be in the greater than. And anything that falls um, above the critical value, we're going to reject at alpha 0 0.05. Anything that falls on the left hand side of the critical value we do not reject so everything that will fall in the white area we do not reject so our t test is 4.4 or we can say it's 4.5 or 4.461 so where it will fall in the blue shaded area therefore we're going to reject that null hypothesis because it falls in the rejection area and we can conclude that the average mood after the comedy is better than the mood after a horror movie. And that's how you will make a decision. So like I said, sometimes you can make a decision based on the critical value, but sometimes we need to make a decision based on the p-value. So taking a, 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 a package like Excel, when you put in the values into the Excel and run the t-test on Excel, it will generate a table, um, a t-test table, which will have all the summary statistics about the test that you just ran. 
and one of the measures that will be included will be the p-value and if you use the same information the p-value that we get from that calculation or from that computer generated software uh, output we get the p-value of 0, 0,0007 and we know the rule says if our p-value is less than alpha we reject the null hypothesis so our p-value is 0, 0,007 which is less than our level of significance which is alpha of 0, 0,05 therefore we can also reach the same con conclusion whether we use the critical value or we use the p-value we're going to reject the null hypothesis and do the same conclusion and that's how you do hypothesis testing so i had oh, because my i didn't check <clears throat> my slides before i published i have an exercise activity for you <clears throat> Consider the following statistic regarding the post-training attitude score. We have group one and group two, and we are given the, the mean and the standard deviation of each group. What are the values in this table? What do we call those values? What do we call the mean and the standard deviations? I would say number one. Why number one? Because those are part of population. Remember, uh, how do I explain it? But I know it's number one. <laughs> uh -huh. If we, if we are doing if we if we are doing a hypothesis testing will you call those part of population i would say yes Any other person? <clears throat> OK, so these are not the population. The, you, are, you, you have actually also, you have a hint given to you at the beginning, what you are looking at in the statement the test statistics if, if uh nope there are not test statistics so um yeah because we hijacked this the 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 sessions we started right in the middle or oh, actually right at the end uh you must remember that you get what we call a population and we, a population if we select measures that come from a population we call them parameters those are the measures that come from a population and because the population is too big enough we select a sample and measures that we select or we we calculate from the sample we call them statistics so everywhere you read about statistics then you must also know that we referring to the measures that comes from a sample and remember we use the sample measures to make conclusions about the population because most of the time we do not know the population parameters especially when we come to inferential statistics so we use the sample statistics to make conclusions about the population parameters because we do not have the information about the population parameters so the answer for this question would have been option number two and you yeah so when you read questions also you must pay attention to keywords in the question because sometimes it gives you and it, it nudges you um to the right answer or response a test statistic uh, in this regard is the 
method that we use to make conclusions? Is that the test statistics from the example? It is that formula that we use to calculate. Um, it's not the mean or the standard deviation. So if they would have said, consider the following parameters, then you would have said this is the population parameters. But because they said, consider the following statistics, and knowing that also we're doing hypothesis testing, uh, where we look at two groups, then these are your sample statistics. So this is your X bar, and this is your S. Okay, so exercise two. If we know that group one has 20 and group two has 20, calculate the value of test statistics. So now here is your chance to, cal to do the calculation for T is equals to the mean for group one plus or oh, minus, so it should be minus. It's the difference of the mean of group two divided by the standard error which is the variance of group one over n of group one plus the variance squared, which is standard deviation squared of group two over n of group two. So you just need to substitute the values Remember, this will be your X bar one, and this will be your S one. So you just substitute the values. I will help you. I will help you with substituting the values. This is mean for group two, and this is S for group two. Let's see if you are able to calculate this. Remember, you can use the chat. Yeah. function as well to post your answers. Let me give you a little bit of time. Remember also to uh, to mute yourself. Especially when you have kids around. Van ek is for kouwe gewees nou. Dat is ook om ek hier dinge sê nie wat. Dus my boos en ook jy Luister ek met my auntie Bonnie, love you the eight time. Au, a tight a a Julian. Ellen. Please mute. I've also posted the register in the chat for those who joined late. Are you winning? We're getting there. We're working on it. Okay.
Ahí está el bise. Are you winning? You need help? I have 1.3088. I'm not sure if. Uh, uh, yeah, 1.3088. 1.3088. That's what you have. Okay. Yes. Okay. So our mean for group one. I, I also have the same. Okay. So we can answer the question now. The mean for group one is 21.65. Minus the mean of group two, which is 20.40, divided by the square root of our standard deviation squared, which is 2.99 squared over our n for group one is 20 plus 305 squared over 20. 3.0. Is it 3 point? Yes, it's 3 point. Zero 05. And then I'm going to use my calculator. And with this calculator, it's easy because I have this fraction thing. So if I press that, I can type the whole equation onto my calculator, which is 21.65. Oh, sorry. 21.65. Point four zero. Then I use my arrows to go down to the bottom one, and the bottom one is the square root. So I'm going to press the square root function. But I also have two fractions. So I'm going to do my first fraction, and in that first fraction, I'm going to do my first value, which is my first value is two point nine nine, which will be two. 0.99 and I'm going to square that by pressing the square button. And then I'll use my arrow to go down and put the 20. So I'm done with the first part, but it needs to add the second one. So using my left arrow, go to the end and then press the plus button. Oh, not the multiply. Delete, delete plus and do again another fraction because that's my other fraction which is 3.05 squared and go down and put the 20 and once i'm done i can also use my arrow twice three times so that it goes and flick at the top and equals one comma three zero eight eight and if we round it off to one decimal we're just going to get a positive one point three so our answer 
is option number three. And that's how you answer. We will answer the questions as well. Excuse me, the calculator that you sent or the link that you sent for the calculator online, it's not the same as this one here. I don't see the arrows on that one. It's only the up is, or down. There is arrows. Um, it oh, will different, be, yeah, they look your different arrows here. will be right in the middle. So if you look, let me open it from my side as well. On my phone. Mm. It's called Keshione. Kesh. I, don't, I don't even know the name. I, there's no name it's here. <laughs> Calc E S. Oh, sorry. I opened the wrong thing. The arrows are there under the word shift. Then there they are shift. Two, there mm. are two. Yeah, there are two arrows. There is a lighter arrow that looks like that, and that looks like that, and then there is the up arrow that looks like that. Hundred percent. Yeah. Do you see them? Yes, I Those do. Those are your arrows on your calculator. Oh, OK. Nah, thank you. Do you see them? Yes, I do see them. Thanks. Yeah, so that is the left, the right, down, and up arrow. Uh, okay, because you, you don't have enough space on, on your phone. They make the buttons bigger so that your finger can be able to, to fit and click. OK. Last exercise relating to this, then we move to the next part of the session. Suppose the two tail P value for the t, t test of a differences between two means in the previous question is 0 0.9. So relating to what we just calculated now. If the P value was 0 0.9 and here we're doing a, they say, if a two-tailed p-value was this, and if alpha is set to 0, 0,1, what will be the decision regarding the null hypothesis? So they just want to, they just want you to look at the test. Are we doing a two-tailed test or are we doing a one-tailed test? So based on the information that we have, we're going to assume that we're doing a two-tailed test in this regard. Or we're doing a, yeah, a one-tailed test because our result says it's a plus. So if we look at this, it will mean that we're doing a one-tailed test. So this is the answer for a one-tailed one -tail test. This will be an answer for a two-tail test, one-tail test. So since option three is a one-tail test, the question here says, suppose that we were given a two-tailed value. Remember, in order for us to find a one-tail test, a one-tail p-value for a one-tail is a two-tail P value divided by two, or a a one tail p value is a or we can say two tail two one tail p value is equals to a two tail, or a one p value or one tail p value is equals to two tail p value divided by two. It's half of the two tail. So since we know that we're doing a one tail test, we are given two tail test. So what will be the decision that we're going to get to? So we need to find the P value first. You need to find the P value. We will need to find the P value for a one tail test. So it means we need to take 0 0.19. We need to divide it by two. And what do you get? 0 0.095. And that will be 0 0.095. And once you have gotten that, you need to go and make a decision. Remember the decision? So let's put there the rule. 
The rule says if the p value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. That is the rule. Based on the information that we just collected now, make a decision. We accept, we accept the hypothesis. Remember what your p value? That's the first Zero. thing that you need to check. We need add. to reject because it is less than your 0 p value 1 is 0, 0,195, which is less than 0, 0,10. So we reject the null hypothesis. Uh, so quick, just, question. Yes. quick question on that one 0 0.09, are we not going to round it off? Because if you round it off, it goes to 0, 0.01. Uh, 0 0.1. No, we're not going to run it off. We're going to use it the same way as we see it now. Why not? Um, also because the other options are not even correct, but we're not going to run it off. We leave it as is. Okay. Because that's the value. So do not round off the value of your alpha because sometimes you will get an alpha value of 0, 0,005. You cannot say that is the same as 0, 0,01. There are two different values. And an alpha value of 0, 0,025 is not the same as, this is not the same as 0, 0,03. They are different. So when you work with p values, don't round them off. Use them as they are. So we know that this was not correct and this is not correct anyway. Because our p-value was 0, 0.095. So you need to use the information that you have to guide you in terms of what you need to be doing. Next. Okay, so I need to run down this one. So the other thing that you need to know and remember as well in your module is we talk about the effect size. And with the effect size, we look at the effect, effect size, which is the Cohen for D or Cohen's D. We can find it when we look at um, the hypothesis testing for one sample size. We can find this when we look at the correlation where we look at the relationship between two variables and so forth because this effect size we use it to make or to compare the different uh, the different means or the different sizes of the means whether are they close to one another or are they is there a huge difference and there is a metric that you use so so that or, or to test the level of importance in terms of that difference that you calculate. And in order for you to find the correct effect size for the test that you are running, you need to use this formula, which says um, your mean for group one minus the mean of group two divided by the pooled sample or uh, the pooled variance. Let's call it that or what we call the estimated standard deviation which is the same as the pooled variance or the pooled standard deviation so if we look at the example that we had previous and let's assume that we calculated the pooled variance um, the formula to calculate the pooled variance which is sp and that's the reason why they don't want you to calculate this is your S1 squared times 1 over N1 plus S2. Um, I, I might be doing something wrong. Minus 1, I think. There is a minus 1 somewhere. Um, it's a very complex formula and I think we divide everything. I, I don't want to write a formula that I don't know by heart. 
but it's a very long complex formula that you need to cal um, calculate to find that and that is the reason why they don't want you to do the pooled variance or the pooled standard deviation formulas um, but they will give it to you so in this instance um, I've calculated it and I found that it was 3.88 so the effect size is 1.15 so it means there is one standard deviation um, from the mean, the two mean groups, uh, one standard deviation from one another with this. So when we do some interpretation as well, we can also look at it in terms of the potent. So whether, um, how large it is. So if your D value is greater than 0 0.8, it means there is a big gap or there is a, a huge difference. Um, between the, the groups as well. So if I look at 1.1, it is large because it's greater than 0 0.8. So therefore, it means the two groups are, they differ. And if I need to interpret it, it will mean that they differ in 1.2 or 1.157 standard deviation away from each other. And that is how we use the effect size to check. Okay, so that is one. Here is your exercise relating to the Cohen's D effect size. Based on the sample, you are given group one and group two and all children pooled. So this, they give you the pooled values or pooled statistics. So here we have our SP. So this is our pooled standard deviation. They also give you the standard deviation, uh, sample standard deviation and the sample mean and the sample size for each group. They give that children and other children. They also give you measures and they tell you that um, the researcher calculated the test statistic and they found that it was 4.196. And they used a computer program to determine that the p-value, which is the level of, um, not the level of significance, but the p-value, the probability for a two-tail, a non-directional test, they found that it was 0 0.02. So if we want to find the one tail on this, we'll have to divide this by two. So a two-tail test, which is highly significant, she, however, concerned that the significant result may be due to the relative large sample size because the sample sizes are big. She needs to decide also and calculate the effect size to determine whether the results are meaningful irrespective of this. So she needs to calculate the Cohen's D using the formula. So you are given the sample mean for group one and the sample mean for group two, and you are given the spool, uh, I'm gonna call it spooled because it's standard deviation pooled variant, or, or I can call it the pooled standard deviation. So you are given S, which is your standard deviation for pooled um, values. Now you need to calculate this, and once you have calculated that, use this table to guide you in terms of whether the D is large, medium, or small. I would say medium. Did you calculate already? Uh, yes. Okay, so what did you do to calculate? Let's uh, substitute the values. 55 minus 49. So it's five, uh, sorry. On the past exam papers, where you see a gap, it means there is a decimal missing, so there should be a 5.5. Oh, this is 1.2. Okay, okay. So, so you must pay attention, especially when you're working with old exam papers. 5.5 minus 4.9 divide by 1.0. So what did you get? So we can calculate it. So that will be 5.5 .5 minus 4.9 equals divide by 1. 
which is the same as the answer that I got. Um, on your calculator, if you get fractions like this, there is an S arrow D, which is changed from decimals to fractions, or you can just press that and you will get a answer of 0 0.6. So you just no, use no. this as... It, it, it's giving me a syntax error. It's not giving me a syntax error. It, give, it gives you syntax error. Error, yes. So did you do 5.5 5 uh, minus? You must make sure that you didn't have any question, any number on there. You can use the AC button to clear your calculator. 5.5 .5 minus 4.9. Koto Wunjan. Which should give you 0 0.6. Wunjan, that's how you send it. Yo. Oh, sorry. Um, are you winning? Okay. So the answer is 0 0.6, which is between 0 0.4, 0 0.4 and 0 0.8, which is medium. Medium, yes. Which is medium. Okay. Any question before we move? No, syntax error. Still say syntax error. Uh, what calculator are you using? Casio. Are you using a Casio? Mm. I don't know why you're getting a syntax error. Um, Sorry, ma'am. I yes. got 0 0.6, yes, I, I got the answer, but then I don't understand how it be, it's medium, small or large. I, I, I think I missed oh. that one. Uh, between 0 0.4 and 0 0.8, it's medium. Oh, okay, I now see the so table. You take this value and you look at the effect size. Oh, okay. To the answer that you get. Thank you um, so much. I don't know what, how, why are you getting a syntax error? Um, on your calculator, if you just do 5.5 .5 minus 4.9 and you press equal, what do you get? What do you see on your calculator? Syntax error. Ah. Okay, so you need to reset your, your calculator. I think there is something wrong with your calculator. Um, and since the Casio calculator does not have a reset button, which it's very okay. tricky to do the reset, um, press the shift button. You see the shift? Press, yes. your, shift. press your shift button. Yeah, and then press the mode button, which has the mode setup. The red one. The red oh, mode setup. I see that. Yeah, yeah. It says. Um, uh, it it's written mode setup. Yeah, it's giving me comp uh, table ratio step. And uh, yeah, press number one. Where it says one. And then press one again. Yeah. And then press one again. One again, one again, one again. I did that. Yeah, and then go and do your calculation again. 5.5 .5 minus 4.9. At the bottom, between zero and between zero, there is a dot, and then there is an X. Pen X. We need to press okay. that next to zero. Yeah, zero point don't six. Press the, don't press the commas at the top next to the negative and the whatnot. No, I've got a zero point six. Zero. You got it. Okay. Yeah, got it. Thank yeah. you. 
then you are ready to do any calculation when we get to any question where we do calculations. All right, so any questions? If there are no questions, then let's look at hypothesis testing for dependent groups or related samples or paid test. So with related uh, population or samples, we need to make some assumption. Both population needs to be normally distributed. If they are not normally distributed, then your sample size n should be large enough. Also, because we're looking at related samples, so sometimes we look at the before and the after, the post, pre and post, before test and after tests. And we no longer do only the difference, but we're going to calculate the difference and use the difference of the scores or the difference of the means in order for us to calculate the test statistic. Okay, so. Therefore, it means we need to be able to calculate as well the mean difference which is the sum of all the observations or the sum of all the differences of your observations divided by how many they are, which is your mean difference. We also need to calculate the standard deviation of the differences. So usually they will give you a table with observations and then you calculate, you, then you will have your pre and post so you will have a table. So they, let's say we have five children in class. So one student, second, third, and fourth, so, and fifth student. We, we test them, the pre-test on concepts, uh, and we get their score. Let's say this one score 80, this one score 10, this one score 30, and this one score 50, and this one scores 60. So those are the scores, and then we take them through a lesson, and then they learn something new, they learn something that they didn't know about, and we give them a test, the same test, because they wrote the test before. Then we give them the, the same test again. This will be the post. And with the post, she gets a hundred because now she knows most, most of the things. She gets 30 or he or she or number two gets 30. And this one, the score improves, gets 50 and the 60 gets 70 and the 70 got eight because of the information we gave them. So in order for us to calculate, we need to find the difference. So we need to say 80 minus 100, which is 20. That's our D, our difference. 10 minus 20, oh, sorry, 10 minus 30 is 20. Oh, this is minus, sorry, I must not forget the minus. 30 minus 50 is minus, and you have the idea. Then we take the difference and we calculate the mean or the sample mean and I will show you all the calculation later on and then we calculate the standard deviation. Easy to do on your calculator. If we have time, um, we can do the calculations on. I will show you on the calculator when we do an example. And then once we have calculated this, then we can calculate the test statistic because we use the difference and we will be given in your hypothesis testing you will or your hypothesis a statement when you state your null hypothesis and alternative you would have give, be given the null um the population difference and then you calculated the standard deviation divided by the square root of n which is your standard error and that will be the test statistics for the paid sample the decision, same as before, we can do the decision for a one-tail test 
two tail test um, or what we call one directional test and non directional test and make a decision. So let's look at an example. So here is where I said I will show you how to calculate some of the things that we need, like the mean and the standard deviation so that it saves you time in case they ask you to do that. So here we are given. Um, we need to assume that you send your salespeople to a customer service training workshop. And we want to test if um, the training has made any difference and is there a decrease in the number of complaints and you collected the data and this are the information. The key thing here is decrease. Pay attention to that weight, decrease. We want to find out if there is a difference in the decrease number of, they didn't say the increase, so it means it's a one tail. So it's a decrease, so it will have and less than in your alternative hypothesis. So we know the names of our salespersons before the complaints, before they went on the training or the workshop, and after the workshop, um, the complaints that came through. We need to calculate the difference. So in this instance, we take two minus one. In my example, I used one minus two. So here we take in two minus one after minus before. So four minus six is minus two. Six minus 20 is 14. Two minus three is minus one. Zero minus zero, so there is still no complaints, is zero. Zero minus four is minus four, so. Quick one. Yes. Uh, how are we supposed to, to take this? Uh, six minus four or four minus six? Um, you can use six minus four. It, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, I'm using after minus two, so you can use before minus after. Okay, thank okay. you. So now we need to calculate the standard deviation and the mean. So what I want to do, I'm going to hide all those other values because I don't need them. I only need the difference. So I need to capture this information on my calculators to save me time. So not to use my formulas because for standard deviation, it's very, very complex. So you can come back to the video and watch and see how I did this. So I'm going to do it as quickly as possible so that we save enough time to do activities. Um, so I need to put my calculator to state mode. So I go mode and there is two and I'm going to select the first one, which is one. And here it gives me a table to capture my information. And my information is minus two, minus 14. There is the negative. So I'm going to say minus two and I press equal. Then it moves to the next line and I can just continue. Minus 14 equal minus one equal zero you must capture everything as you see it as you have calculated it zero equal and minus four equal and i've captured everything there are one two three four five so there are five so i've captured everything then i can go on and off my calculator now i'm ready to calculate the mean remember I'm going to put the to calculate the mean. The mean is the sum of all these values, which is at minus 21, divided by how many there are. There were five. So I will calculate the mean on the calculator, which is the shift and step, which is button number one. Then I'm just going to go to button number four because that's where the means are. And there is my mean, which is two. So I'm using two. And I press equal. And I can see that if I take 21 and I minus 21 divide by five, I will get the same answer, which is 4.2. Calculating the standard deviation, which is this formula. 
which is the sum of your observation minus the mean squared divided by n minus 1. What it means, it says take minus 2 minus minus 4.2 square the answer plus minus 14 minus minus 42 square the answer plus minus 1 minus minus 42 square the answer plus until you get to 4. Divide everything by 5 minus 1. Once you've calculated what is inside the square root, take the square root. Long calculation, long formulas. Now, on your calculator, we just go shift, stat, 4 again, and we're looking for this, Sx, and which is on button number 4, and you press equal, and the answer is 5.67. So if you do the long calculation, you will get 5.674 which is the same as that answer that we have here. So that is our standard deviation. Then now we can go and do our hypothesis testing. So we know that we need to check if there is a difference in the decreased number of complaints at alpha 0, 0, uh, 0, 0,10. State the null hypothesis and alternative, remember, it said there is a decrease, it was less than, so it means in our alternative hypothesis, we can state that the population mean difference is less than zero. Step number two was to state what you are given in order to assist you in knowing which one you are calculating, whether it's the t-test for the difference or is it the t-test for the independent. So also we can go and find the critical value which will give us the region of rejection. Our degrees of freedom helps us to find the critical value. Then we calculate the test statistic. Remember we've calculated our mean difference. We found that it was minus, the mean was minus 4.2 and our population mean is zero, always going to be zero divide by the standard error, which is the standard deviation, which we did last, 5.67, divide by the square root of 5, because there were 5 observations. And the answer we get is minus 1.66. Using our critical value, we find the region of rejection, or the rejection area. We define that, and we make our decision. Since our hypothesis set is less than, so it is in the negative side, so our critical value will be negative 1.533, and our test statistics was negative 1.66, so it falls in the rejection area. When our mean says that there is no difference, we say there is an, in, a decrease difference. Um, number of complaints. So we can see that we reject the null hypothesis, which says there is no, there is no difference. Um, and we can see that there is a significant difference in the number of complaints. There is a difference, or there is a significant decrease in the number of complaints. And that's how you will make a decision as well. So on um, here is an Excel output taking the same kind of values that we had. Um, the thing with the Excel output is it doesn't calculate the mean difference. All what it does is it calculates the mean of the pre and the mean of the post, which we don't need. Um, all these statistics are related to each group or each sample the pre and the post. Um, what it also does is to calculate the test statistic, remember, is the same as what we got. If I go back, we got minus 1.66. Um, on this instance, it left it as a positive. Um, and 
it calculated the p-value. So we can use the p-value from here. We know that we're doing a one-tail test and we can take that one-tail test, which is 0 0.086. We know that our alpha is 0, 0,01. So our p-value of 0, comma, so we get the p-value of 0, comma, 0.086 because it's a one-tail, 0, comma, 0.086, and it is less than 0, comma, one zero. So we still reject the null hypothesis. We're still going to res uh, get the same information that we got when we do the critical value. Any questions? If there are no questions, then we can move to looking at activities. Remember, using your calculator to do the step mode when you get to that that part you can pause the video and do step by step and make sure that you understand how i did it as well but it's going to be very rare for you to be asked to do the calculation in, especially to calculate the mean and the standard deviation in the exam as well so let's look at more activities we will work through them together so If you want to take a two minutes break, you can do so. And then we can use the 30 minutes that is left to go through the activities. Okay, so if there are no if there are no comments or anything, so let's let's continue them and work through the exercises. A researcher wants to test the following hypothesis, and they gave you the hypothesis. The alternative states that the group one is greater than group two. On the basis of the data provided, the output from a computer program indicates the T value of 1.72. And the P value for the two tail test is given as P is equals to 0, 0.056. What should the researcher do to evaluate the results of this significance? alpha at 0, 0.05. Similar exercise that we just did. What do you need to do? The first thing you need to look at is the sign in your alternative hypothesis. This is a one directional, so it means it's a one tail test. And since it's a one tail test, we are given the p-value of a two-tail test. So what is the p-value? Note, note 0.056. Nope. What will be the p-value? The p-value for for one tail will be taking the p value of the two tail and dividing it by two. We just two, did this zero, not two, so long ago. Two, eight. So you'll take zero, two, your two, zero, two eight. p value and divide by two. So we don't even have to work it out. Because the question here says, what should you do to evaluate the results? Look at the options. Which option will it be? Option number one. Number one, it will be option, 
Yes, it will be option number one, where we take the p-value and divide it by two. So you always need to look at what you're given in the alternative and compare to the p-value that you are given. If it's a one tail, and let's say they give you a one tail p-value and they say this is a two tail or a non-directional, which is not equal. Therefore, it means you will take your one tail and you multiply it by two. So then it means option two would have been correct. Um, this divide by two, we do not do that. You cannot divide your alpha to compare it to the p-value. We leave alpha as is. So option one is the correct one. Exercise two. A researcher, um, if maybe even let me go back to this. If you look at this question, I took it from the psych uh, paper of 2017. The exercise or activity that we did previously, I took it from a tutorial letter 101 activity. So you can see that your your questions are almost exactly the same. So you just need to pay attention uh, to small things like the values, um, uh, the details given for each question as well. So you will notice that most of the question, they will look as if like they are familiar. We have done it before or, or not. Um, so exercise two, a researcher suspects there uh, is a difference between the creative ability of boys and girls in school for gifted children. She uses a test for creativity that has a standardized in such a way that the mean creative ability score for the general population is 50. Which of the following possible way to state the null hypothesis? What will be the null hypothesis? I would say T. Why two? Uh, the researchers has, um, suspects that's, that's, that uh, there, there's a difference. So if you suspect that the, dif the difference, the null should be that there's no difference. Yeah. And your, your, but yeah. two, what does two, does two tell you there's, there's a difference? Uh, no, okay. I was just, I was continuing there and uh, your, your value there is 50, so uh, if there is a difference, it either has to be greater than 50 or less than 50. But we're testing the difference between two groups. And this is the difference of one population. It's not the difference of two groups. Oh. So this is incorrect. I'll say option three. When we state the hypothesis testing, we never state the hypothesis testing using the sample statistics. So okay. three would be correct. The only option that is correct is option number one. We always one. use the population parameter to state the null hypothesis. Based on the same information that we had, number three. Yeah, number three. Okay. Number three. 
In which of the following research situation is the most, is it most likely that a test for comparing independent groups will be used? So now you need to ask yourself a lot of questions here. So we need, we're comparing two independent groups. So either, Um, when we compare two groups, what do we check? We check for if there are any differences. So, reading those three statements, which one is the correct one? I would say to it will be two because two is talking about evaluating the differences, whereas the others they are evaluating the development of verbal skills, they just evaluating the effectiveness of new medication, but never the difference between the groups. So you need to also make sure that you understand what the hypothesis for independent is aiming to do, we always look at the difference. The same way as next time when we meet, we do the relationship, you always need to think about when we look at the relationship, what do we talk about as well. So key things, key small things will tell you what you are doing. What is Cohen's D? Effect size. It is the effect size. Okay, you can check the definition of Cohen's. In which circumstances can the Z test for comparing two independent mean not be used? I know that we didn't do Z. But think about everything that we just did today. So today we were talking about for T test. Um, remember last week, actually, remember last week we spoke about hypothesis testing for the for the mean, hypothesis testing for the mean for one sample size. And we said, if the population parameter of the standard deviation, let's go there. If the population standard deviation is known, we use Z. If it's unknown, if the population standard deviation is unknown, we use T. Based on that information, in which circumstance Option four. Z? Option four. And, and remember that sigma is your population parameter. Option four is talks about sample standard deviation, which is not correct. And also option four speaks about unknown. Option two. Option two, it talks about the correct thing, but it says unknown. When do we use Z? I just gave you the answer. When it is known, it says answer one, it's known, it's known, to, available to the researcher. Option one will be the correct answer. It's when, when your population parameters are known and available to the researcher, we use the Z test. 
even if we talk about the independent, for independent as well, we use a Z test, but when they are known, if they are unknown, that's when we use the T test. And in your module, always we use the T test for independent samples. <clears throat> we never what use the Z Sorry to project. What confused me was the it means not to be used. That's why I went to the other side of the When? Oh, when not to be used. Oh, yes, you are right. When not to be used. Sorry. My bad. Yes, you are right. So in which circumstance a Z test for comparing two independence means not to be used is when the population standard deviation for two groups are unknown. We cannot use the Z test. Um, this won't be right because we never refer to the means. We never refer to the sample. We and then this will definitely we will use it if we're looking at the T test. Sorry, whoever answered option two was right. My bet. I keep on telling you uh, small things and I forgot to read the whole question. And those small things happen. So this is also a key thing that we need to remember. Okay, so number B, two samples may be regarded as independent when? There is no systematic relationship between the composition of the one and the other. That will be correct. Okay, so a market researcher is asked to conduct a study to examine people's reaction to a movie trailer. He draws a random sample of 20 males and 20 females who saw the trailer. He asked them to indicate how likely it is that they will go and see a movie on a seven point scale where one indicates not at all, seven indicates definitely. He wants to compare to establish whether males and females differ in their intention to see the movie based on an exposure to the trailer. Suppose that the researcher finds that the mean and the standard deviation for the group samples is as follows. They've given you the measures, which is the appropriate way to indicate the researcher's hypothesis, which is to be tested. Remember the keyword, decrease, Increase, change, difference. And this is your key statement. If there is anything there that includes or involves things like increase, decrease, or just the difference, you will know. Remember that increase. It will be greater than decrease. Will be less than and just the difference or a change. Will be not equal. I think the answer is three. The answer will be three because number one actually it's you not even look at it because it uses the sample mean. And for the fact that there is no way where it mentions less or greater than or 
increase or decrease. Therefore, this won't be the right one. So option three is the only option that is correct. Based on the same information, which is the appropriate t-test to calculate, to evaluate the significance of the hypothesis? Ask yourself, we're testing two groups. Is it the test for difference between two independent sample? Is it for the single sample? Is it for two dependent samples? One, two, or three? I think it's three. It would have been three Option if three. they were using only males and they test them before they go and after they come out. It's number one. It's one. It will be number one because there are two groups. Ask yourself those two groups, males and females. Can males be part of the the females or females be part of the males? No, it cannot be, so it's independent. A researcher is asked by a motivational speaker to establish whether a workshop on assertiveness training is effective. The researcher decides to use a particular questionnaire which tests an individual level of assertiveness. He presents the questionnaire to each of the sample of 50 participants in a workshop before it begins and once after has ended to the same participant. When analyzing the results, the researcher should use a test for the hmm? option number one. two. Number two. It will be number two because he does the before and after on the same group. Yeah. A sample of 70 is had to be tested, uh, blah, 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 all the whole story. Which formula to use to test? Which formula do we use for the before and after? Okay, let me help you. Option two. This Option is two. to test one sample. Option two. This is to test independent sample. Independent sample. And this is to test the dependent samples. So are we dealing with dependent or independent? Remember it's the same question. Three. Number Where three. The before and after. So number three. Pay attention to the statement. So before and after, we are doing dependent. If it was male and female, we're doing independent, so it would have been this. So before and after. Male and female uh, i'm just gonna use one variable gender i don't know what else i can do I'm lazy to read the whole sentence, but let's do that because we might miss something. A social psychologist wants to test how long people will wait before responding to cries of help from an unknown person. The psychologist wants to confirm his suspicion that people will take less time to react when they hear a female voice than when they hear a male voice. He tests this on a sample of N15 people who are told 
one at a time to sit in a waiting room to be called for an interview. While they wait, each participant hears a call for help from a male or a female voice, which is actually a recording. The dependent variable is the number of seconds each participant waits until they go to investigate or try to help. The sample follows following the sample statistics are calculated as follows. The male voice, the information is there. Female voice, the information is there. Given the findings, what type of a statistical test will a psychology has a psychologist have to confirm the relevant statistical hypothesis or to do to confirm the relevant statistical hypothesis? Nothing. Mm, Number what four, nothing. No. Yes. Why nothing? Remember, he wants to confirm that the, you know the, the the people will take less time to help a female when they hear a female voice. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the at the at the at the readings there, the female's voice uh, takes fifteen point three seconds, which is much smaller than the male one. Yeah, but it cannot be nothing. Yeah. Because he wants to take how long he, he what he's testing is how long people go to assist when they hear a person cries for help. No, so he, it is not saying how long. It just says whether people will take more or less time. Whether they will take more time on one side or less time on the other side. Yeah, but the test is he wants to test how long people will wait before responding to cries. That's mm -hmm. what the researcher wants to test. Yeah. Then I the think other thing that will help to you know what type of a test you're going to be doing is that statement, the less time. Are you so it cannot be a no statistical test. There is a statistical test that he needs to do. The um the only other options that I left is one, two, and three, where no statistical test is necessary, it's irrelevant, yeah, because there is a statistical test that he can do because he recorded the number of times or the number of time people go and assist while they were waiting in the room as well. So he has the information to help him do the test. So what you need to ask yourself is, are you doing a one tail? Which one will be the relevant one? Are you doing a one tail statistical test? Because we're looking for a statistical test, not the type of a um, method that we are doing, whether it's dependent or independent. We way past that. We know that we're doing an independent test, but we want to know what type of a statistical test they need to be conducting. Let me ask a question. So if I know that, you know, from the readings that the values that I get, they mm -hmm. sort of nullify my, my, my initial suspicion. So why would I continue and test? No, it doesn't nullify your suspicion. My, my how, suspicion, how, my suspicion how, is that you know, people will know? take less time. Yes, that's your suspicion, but we need to test that. Remember, there are two sides to an to the court. There is the truth and there is the opposite of that. So there okay. is two sides. So okay. your, your opinion, so the mm -hmm. researcher's opinion, that is his claim. His claim is that they take less time. That is his opinion. Yes. Of the research. We need to prove that. We need to prove the researcher whether the statement is right or wrong. That's what we need to do. So, what type of a test will we be doing? Is it a one-tail test or is it going to be a two-tail test that we're going to be doing to prove this based on the researcher's assertion, based on their claim? And that is what, this is very important. That is why you need to take into consideration all those. Remember when we were doing this activity, I said, look out for words like this in your statement, because they will give you those kind of statements to 
tell you whether are you doing a one directional, which is that, or one tail test statistic, or are you doing a two tail test statistic? In this statement, nothing different from everything that we have been doing. What type of a test statistic? That less type. That's what the researcher wants to prove. So it's a two tail you know, test. It's taking less time, so therefore it means we're going to be doing a one tail test to prove that assertion. And state the null hypothesis, do the calculation for the test statistic, make conclusion. That's all what you will need to do. But in before you do that, before knowing where you need to make a decision, the important thing is, is it a two tail? Are we going to find two regions of rejections? When we look at the p-value, are we going to find the p-value in the two-tailed p-value, two, uh, two or are we doing a one-tailed p-value to make that decision? So the answer for this one is a one-tailed test, test statistic. That's what we're doing based on the information. Uh, I'm not clear on that because uh, last time you said for the two tail it's male and female. Then for the nope. symbol, then you said hmm? no, yeah. no. Nope. Oh, for the independent, it was independent, male oh, and yes. female, independent yes. before and after. Okay, okay, now I see. Increase now is I see. less than greater than. I was talking to this, so increase okay. greater than. Decrease, which is less than, which is decrease, tells you whether it's a one direction, which direction. Okay, now I see. I then, see. So if they would have said it takes more time, so it would have been a greater than, sorry, it would have been more time, would have been a greater than. Less time, it's a less than, which is a decrease. If they didn't, if they said, if, if, yeah, the researcher would have said, I want to confirm my suspicion that people take time without mentioning less or greater than, then it would have been a difference because then there will be a difference between um, uh, how uh, the difference of how long they go when a, they hear a female voice and how long they go when they hear a male voice. Okay, we left with two minutes. Let's see if we can answer this last question. A researcher wants to test the hypothesis and they gave us the hypothesis, null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis on the basis of the data provided. The output from a computer program indicates that the t value is that much 1.72 was found with the p value of a two tail test of zero and i think this is almost the same question as we did before what should the researcher do to evaluate this result one I think. Uh, whoever said number four is correct. Pay attention. The sign is a two direction or two tail. This is a this is a two tail test. They gave you a two tail test p value and the alpha. You cannot be dividing, you cannot multiply, you cannot divide. The only thing you need to do because you have the p-value and the alpha is just to compare your p-value with the given alpha. Tricky. Whereas on the previous one, the sign here was greater than, so it was a one tail test. So we needed to divide. So now this is a two tail test, we just compare. And that concludes today's session, but I do have 
a lot of other questions or exercises, um, not too many. Um, exercise 14 and exercise 15. If you want, we can continue the conversation on WhatsApp. And <clears throat> uh, if you're not sure about the answer for 13 and 14, 13, sorry, how many questions? 12, 13, 14, and 15. 15 has A and B. Uh, we can have those discussion on WhatsApp. Otherwise, thank you for participating today and being part of the discussion. So if there are any comments, question, query, now is your platform. Now is your time to ask or comment. Please make sure that you also uh, complete the register if you haven't. I will repost it because I know that sometimes it disappears for those who joined late. And if there are no questions and comments, I will just close off the session. Um, today we looked at hypothesis oh, testing for the video. dependent yeah. samples. Remember? Um, for independent sample, the one does not, or the groups does not affect the other. One does not depend on the other. They are independent. So the other group does not contain members from the other group. Dependent is the same group, but we test in the two variables, the pre and the post, the before and the after. And with that, I hope you will have a lovely, lovely week ahead and enjoy your evening. But before you leave,